this is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to the Whole Horse Podcast. I'm coming to you from the Cowichan Valley on beautiful Vancouver Island in Canada, and I'm excited to be bringing amazing instructors from around the world to share their knowledge about all the ways that we can keep ourselves and our horses well and happy, and about some of the cutting edge techniques, training, and different aspects that are coming into the horse industry and changing it from within. I'm so excited you're here, and I'm excited about the times that we live in and the shifts that are happening in the horse industry before our eyes. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. It's Alexa here, and you're on the Whole Horse Podcast for episode 46 today. We're heading into 2020 with some amazing guests, and my next guests are no exception. I'm here today with Robin Hood and Sinead McCann from Australia. We're we're here from all around the world today um, to chat about uh, Tea Touch and beyond today. So I'm, I'm so happy to have you both here. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks. Thanks, Alexa. We're very excited to be here. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I met, uh, Robin and I were just reminiscing and, and realizing that we met about, you know, 14, 15 years ago in Victoria at a, uh, the Healthy Horse Expo, if any of you remember. And, um, and I met Sinead last year. I had the pleasure of, of working with her in my uh, workshop uh, when I went to Canberra last year and, and um, it was absolutely fabulous. I loved working with her there. And of course, um, you it too, was it was amazing. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and the two of you are very involved in, in something called Tea Touch with, which some of our audience may not even really know about. So I, I'd love to begin by, um, you know, having maybe both of you share a little bit about, you know, what that means to you, what that, that work means to you and how it showed up in your life. So Robin, would you share a little, cause I know this is very, this is very um, near and dear for you. So I was sort of born into it because uh, my sister, Linda Tellington Jones is really started developing um, the Tellington method or T-Touch or team as it used to be sort of called originally. And it was, um, we've been in horses all our lives. So I could ride before I could walk. And, and Linda had a, a, an instructor school in um, California and a, and a residential school. And, and then she got tired of the things that people did to horses to win a ribbon in the early seventies. And she took a training with Moshe Feldenkrais. And that training, if anyone is familiar with the Feldenkrais method, which is a really amazing method for humans, that was really a turning point in her life actually with horses. Mm -hmm. I love that work. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. And so Linda decided, or she realized actually in the first day of her training or the first week that when Moshe made a statement that the nervous system had the possibility of learning in one lesson, if there was no pain involved, if it was done through non-habitual movement, that was not a threat to the body. She said, Hmm, her ears pricked up and she thought, if that's true for people, that it's probably true for horses. And before that, her whole life had been this concept that, you know, we have to, horses only learn through repetition. You just have to keep going and doing it over and over again. And, you know, you just do what you have to do to get them, not in an unkind way, because that's not how she ever worked. But she went, um, so then she went out to a horse and she started doing some non-habitual things, which she thought, well, what if I moved it's tail in a different way and its legs the little kind of movement of the legs and move its ears and uh she looked kept looking for something to happen and nothing really happened and so she thought well maybe it doesn't work on horses and so she went um her friend called her the next day and and said you know i don't know what you did to my horse but instead of not wanting to be caught and just rushing into the stall when they were and grab you know diving into the feed bowl, the horse walked up to the gate, waited for me, came into the stall, stood there and waited for me to do something. So she realized at that point that even though she did something that was not related to the issues that the horse had, that it could really make a difference. So from that, this is like 45 years on. Wow. Work has just, you know, continued to develop. And um, I've been a part of it 
for the last 35 years, 37 years, uh, 37 years. So it's, uh, it's great. It's just fun. It's, it's really, we get to work with people, fantastic people and seeing the changes in animals. We don't just work with horses. We work with all animals, dogs, lots of dogs and pretty much everything from snakes to elephants. So Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen some of the pictures and things. <laughs> yeah. And I know that even some of the techniques and stuff are named after particular animals. So that's, that's pretty amazing as well. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that for sure, Robin. I just wanted to open that up to Sinead. Sinead, what's your sort of understanding of the T-Touch work that you've done and how okay. it's helped? Well, um, I was introduced to the Tellington Method probably about five, six years ago when I had Rebecca Booth from Elementals Equine Therapies um, actually work on my horse, um, Clancy at the time. And I was actually a human um, masseuse. And what I was, you know, watching uh, Rebecca work on my horse and, and I seen her hand placements and the movements and her breath. And I was like, this is, this is not, you know, usual I just thought it was very very strange to see um such non what would you say um such small subtle movements and then when I got on Clancy um a couple of days later uh it, the horse he completely changed his range of motion was absolutely smooth it actually changed our relationship I seen a softer side I felt a deeper connection to him and I thought I really really need to know more about this so Rebecca asked um, if we could actually host a clinic uh, at my adjustment place and we organized it and she set it up into two, two separate clinics. One was body work and then the other was the ground work. Um, <clears throat> the body work one, I, I, as I said, I was a masseuse. I thought, oh, I smashed this. I know I can do this. And it completely, absolutely flipped in my mind <laughs> how... Um, the circular motion, so the, um, a full clockwise circle and a quarter, and the tempo, the speed, the, the lightness was absolutely mind-blowing. So we worked on each other first before we actually went to our horse. When I finished that clinic, and then the second one with the grand work, where my horse was a lot more balanced, he was a lot more confident, he was actually able to think for himself, I just thought, this is it, This I need to know more about this, I'm really, this this was it for me and <clears throat> I was lucky enough that um, not so long after that Robin allowed me to be a practitioner in training and I've done the training and I am just absolutely passionate about the, the method and I really want to show people and get people to understand that there's a lot more to it than just body work. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. So I would love, because I realized as we were chatting before the call, um, that uh, there is some common misconceptions about T-Touch and that I am, I am also guilty of <laughs> not, you know, I've, I've taken like a mini T-Touch course on, a, on, a, on yes. dogs and I've done little things. Um, I would love to hear from you, Robin, like, you know, what are some of those common misconceptions and, and like, you know, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going, how do, what is T-Touch and how does it actually work? Yeah, that's a big question, isn't it's it? Big question. <laughs> because, um, so there are basically kind of five components of T-Touch, you could say. And, um, and, and the, the first one are the, is observation. And, and it's not just about observing big things, but it's about teaching people to observe when their horses are, are whispering to them instead of when they're shouting at them. And I, I um, if I could just sort of tell you a sort of a short story about in 1999, we did a, we took our, our group of practitioners to, uh, it, to the LA Equestrian Center where Dr. Klimka was doing his last really big, um, he, did a, he did a seminar where he had 1,200 spectators and 12 riders, um, two of each through first level through Grand Prix. And so what he's a, he is a most gracious man and, and Linda did a little demo on the night before it started. And then we worked on all the horses in between the lessons because he would take two horses at a time at each lesson in at each level. And there was a horse that had at one point been California horse of the year, Grand Prix horse, and he'd lost his Piaf. 
And Linda used them in her demo. And what was really interesting, because we also kind of, you want to be a detective in terms of finding out where things start and kind of the relationship of things. And he, so what I noticed the first thing when Linda was working with him is even when she took the wand, you know, the dressage with stiff whip across and stroked his belly just to see where he was comfortable about being touched. He was not at all comfortable with that. And what we found out is that he was a horse that had to be completely have a general anesthetic to have his sheath cleaned. Wow. And so interestingly enough, I, I worked with a horse and I, um, he, you couldn't put like when they would put boots on him, when they would groom him, when they would mm -hmm. do anything, he would kick at them. Now, if he wanted to kick them, he would have kicked them. All he was trying to do is be, say, be careful. So I had him in the, I had, was working on him in between the first, um, first and second lesson. And, and so what I did is I started with the back of my hand underneath his belly and I just started going really slowly. And the moment that he changed his eye, his ear, his breathing, anything, I stopped. And so I just paused for a moment and just wait till he took a breath. I would take a breath and I moved my way back until I actually, at the end of the first session, I could completely handle him around the sheath area. I was able to get, and his head was down. People walked by the stall and they said, is this horse tranquilized? And I said, no. So he was just standing freely. And then I got some Excalibur. I was able to get some around the sheath area. I've never seen anything like it. It was several inches thick of schmegma. Hard. Oh my gosh. So no wonder he lost his pee off. There's no way that he could engage yeah. his hindquarters with that much discomfort in the area. So anyway, I worked on it a little bit. I was able to, obviously, I couldn't get it, couldn't get it off. You can't, it would be like pulling scab. So anyway, yeah. but I got it softened. He was 100% com comfortable with me handling him all around the area, going actually inside the sheath area and getting Excalibur there, then warm water and so on. So by the last day, he had... <coughs> Wow. And, and what was so interesting, though, is he, he really made it so clear to me that if you listen to the whispers, then they don't have to shout. Yep. And, and <clears throat> that part of the observation, and it isn't that, you know, that, you know, the old concepts of horses, well, you have to show them who's boss. We all know that, you know, I'm sure your listeners are not into that at all, but it's not uncommon when you, you know, in terms of what we're, what we see. And they're, you know, behavior is just a form of communication. That's what yep. it, it's just mm. a form of communication. And we aren't very good at listening. And so it's, so it was fascinating to be in, in, in looking at this source. So observation is, plays the role in everything that we do. So we also have the body work, which is what it's best known for. And I, I believe that why so many people think that it's just about body work is the whole idea of the Tellington T-Touch. The name went from Originally, it was Tellington Touch Equine Awareness Method. Yeah, T Team. I remember that. And so when, and, and I think it was in 19, I was just trying to think of the year that, um, that um, Thane Marketing came, approached to, to do infomercials on the uh, horse work, the dog work, and the cat work. And so, of course, they have to have some marketing like tool and so on. And so they really branded it with this you know, the touch of magic. And so, so that's actually where I think it got kind of rebranded in, in that way. So body work is for sure a big part of it. But even when Linda started, she didn't think she could teach people the body work. This was when, I mean, after her Feldenkrais training. And so what she did is, you know, in Feldenkrais, the awareness through movement is a huge part of the, of the whole process. And so she was teaching people how to mindfully move move their horses through different elements like the labyrinth and over poles and you know in the horse world there's you know been a huge push to groundwork and in my opinion a lot of the groundwork is actually detrimental to body work that may be done on horses because it's putting them in a posture that's actually not functional so that's the other part of what we do is that within the body work it needs to be functional and everything that we do with our horses we want to create a posture that we, we would want to have them in when we're working with them. So we, there's no time that we ever want our horse's head to be up and their back to be dropped. Yes, it must be biomechanically correct. Exactly. So yes. if you create that up, head up, back drop because you're trying to back a horse off or get respect or whatever you want to call it, 
you're just negating, I have to say, so much of any kind of body work that might be done on your horses because you're putting them back into that habitual pattern of dysfunction, which mm. is exactly <laughs> the same issues that people have in terms of why we have pain. It's our posture. So there's a huge connection between posture and behavior. And that's where we connect the body work with the groundwork. And, and then of course we have body wraps that we put on them, which is another way of helping them get a sense of proprioception, where they are in space so that they can make better choices about how they behave. And that's, you know, a, if we were to simply make a simplified thing is what is this whole Tellington method about? I look at it as it's about reducing stress so that animals can um, make better choices by teaching them how to function in, in um, posture, appropriate posture that's biomechanically correct, that's functional in what they do. So we have that, so we have these tools we use, we have the groundwork that we do, um, and we have what we call the joy of riding. So we have um, lots of different tools we use under saddle. We take the body wraps under saddle for people and the horses. We use the balance ring. <laughs> the neck ring there's you know all sorts of things so that we want the horses to go it's not just now we're making you feel good by working on your body or maybe we're going to do some kind of groundwork that may or may not be okay and then we're going to get on you and um we want to take that into being a positive experience for them beautiful um did you did you both know that i've wanted to take a course with robin for like 15 years <laughs> <laughs> What's stopped you? <laughs> I don't know. I think mean, I like always, it's like Murphy's Law. There's always something yeah. else going on. It's like, yeah. okay, I got to do this. I'm sitting here going, I got to do this. Robin comes to Australia every year. You're going to have to come out. <laughs> <laughs> she lives four hours away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no excuse. Oh, goodness. Thank you, Robin. I just I love that because I, I think for so many of us, yeah, we see these, these pieces of that work and or we understand pieces of it. You know, for me, I know the, the body work has been more sort of like, oh, that's what tea touch is. And I, I'm like, oh, yeah, but there's that wrap thing, you know, like, so it, it's so nice to hear that all sort of like banded together so to speak so like to understand the whole the whole theory there um of of how it all weaves together because really at the end of the day for many of us we're still wanting to ride our horses yeah you know, and work yeah. with them that way and we want to work with them functionally you yeah. know in a way that's not going to harm them yeah right well and yeah. i think you know i think the thing is that uh, and I don't have any problem if, if someone doesn't want to ride their horse, I don't care. You know, like there's no horse on this world that said, oh my God, please ride me. You know, if you don't ride me, I'm going to be really, really unhappy. And, and so I think that, but, but we do, you know, I mean, there's nothing, you know, especially if you, depending on what you enjoy and it doesn't matter, it, it's, it's it between you and your horse, but, you know, making it something that's a positive in terms of the relationship. And that's the other thing that I see is that, when people start to pay attention to small things about their horses and their observation, they start to, and they start to listen, the horses go, you know, you've got it. And the relationship changes. And, and I, I think, I tell you, I think it's a tough thing for people because until you're in, if, until you've got a hold of that horse or you're sitting on that horse or whatever, you don't know what someone's dealing with. And you know, you see all the time or hear people going, well, if they just did so-and-so, it would be different. And we can't know that until we're in their position or we're having their horse or we live with that horse or dog or whatever it happens to be. And I believe that any of us could look at any of us and say, oh, if they only did such and such, you know, they, it would work. And we don't know where it's all the same. Everyone is really doing the best they can with, um, with what they have. So, um, it's, but you know, if we can make riding for horses fun and, and we know that that's where that whole holistic thing of paying attention to all the things that go with the, with the riding, you know, with the, yeah. the teeth and saddle and you know, how the body feels, we have to keep remembering that horses weren't really made to be ridden. So it's a huge, um, you know, gift that they give us in my opinion to, to allow them, you know, allow us to ride them. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, you I think, number one, you're very right about the riding piece. You know, I know my mare's like, um, 
do we do we have to do this writing thing like she's turning 21 in may she's very convinced she should be retired <laughs> and but for me it's also keeping her sure. solid keeping her strong you know she's a long back horse she definitely probably was not meant to be ridden <laughs> um you know the percheron forever <laughs> back um yeah, so it's it's great to hear this, and I want to get in in a little bit into some of the specific ways that we can help our horses with that using this work. I wanted to just um, tune in to you, Sinead. Did you have any other things to add about sort of some of the misconceptions you see around around this work? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, there is. Um, I think we just before we actually started, um, I was just talking about that. You know, people think that the Talented Method is just a body work, um, when in fact it's um, a way of actually working with our animals and understanding their behaviour. So, looking at the connection between um, the emotion, the mental, and the physical side to the horse. And the one thing I absolutely loved when I first got into um, Tellington Tea Touch was was you know actually observing our horse i never you know i just like yeah that's my horse in the paddock that's yeah that's my horse eating but then you know the subtleties of actually watching um his ear or how he you know placed a leg where how he was breathing when he blinked did his ear flick back i never seen that i see my horse but i didn't really truly see it and with the tellington method it was just you know i was pulled back and and i and i seen it and also I learned to see the perfection in every single horse. Mm -hmm. And I still do. I really, I don't believe there's anything as um, a naughty horse or they're trying to get one over you or anything like that. As Robin said, you know, they are really trying their very, very best to communicate. And also when horses are not physically balanced, they're not mentally balanced either. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they don't really have as much um, self-control. So, you know, it goes from a whisper to a scream. Yeah, pretty fast sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I would love to chat because I know one of the things that I've sort of, that's been impressed upon me in terms of T-Touch work is this connection to the nervous system. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me in my work and, you know, working with, with all sorts of things, trauma, um, you know, relaxation release of residual tension that that nervous system piece just kind of keeps dropping in it, it yes it's, it's so consistent um so i would i would love to get a better grasp of how this work kind of connects to that that aspect of us and our horses um yeah, yeah. so uh, if i just start and i'll let you go with this Sinead. so and and Sinead mentioned um i think a little bit earlier about the whole thing of um cellular function and and so the thing about my sister, Linda, is she has always been at least 20 years ahead of her time. And she would say things and people would go, oh, that's ridiculous. And 20 years later, everyone's doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those things was this concept of, um, of improving cellular function. And, you know, if we think about it, it's actually fairly simple. Every cell in our body knows its, you know, it knows its function and it knows the function of all other cells. That's why we are made up of what we are. And um, she used to quote um, Sir, Sir Charles Sherrington, who, you know, like a long, long time ago, realized that if you cut two nerves, they had the ability to grow back together because they had the ability to know where there was, um, where they were actually meant to be. And so when she, that's what made her so interested in the nervous system. So if we, if we kind of look at it from a practical perspective in the nervous system, so all of us have habits and habits are not bad. We, we get through our lives a lot faster if we have some habits, right? Because we don't have to relearn everything all the time. The thing about habits is habits bypass the thinking part of our brain. So there's this little mechanism called the central pattern generator. And once we know how to do something well and we really don't have to think about it anymore, that's where that process goes through until we have an injury, we have something changes to that, that, that might um, make it difficult for us to do our old pattern. And then what happens is our nervous system suddenly pays attention. 
And you can do a really simple exercise, which if anyone can, we can do this, you know, even though you can't see it. So if I have people just interlock their fingers together and nobody has to think about doing that. You know, you, we interlock our fingers and we might look down and notice that um, they'll be one of your thumbs obviously will be on top and then your fingers are interlaced, you know, alternately. Now, if you take those fingers apart and you interlace them exactly the opposite way so the other thumb is on top and down so um, you go with your hands unless you do this on a regular basis and you're doing this right now you might find that you're actually paying a little more attention to what your fingers feel like than to what I'm saying mm -hmm. and that's how so that's one of the reasons that we do these kind of novel or non-habitual things so in order to change a habit there has to be novelty and this goes along with trauma as well, which is, this is a, the whole thing is the deconsolidation process and, and so on is what you, what you have to have is you have to have something that is, um, that is, is different, but not too different. That's too hard. You have to take them, take them out of that comfort, but then bring them back. So you can't take them. So we might, we might, you know, the, one of the labyrinth, this little maze is one of the things we do. So we start out and we want to make it so that it's really simple and we notice how the horse negotiates. You know, do they track around each corner? Do they kind of, are they like a board going around some corners? And, um, and then we can say, well, let's see, what if we change it? What if we made it wider? What if we, um, we stop them in different places? What, you know, we just mm -hmm. notice what happens. What if we added a body wrap? So every time we change one thing, every time we change something, we change the context. If you change the context, you change the experience. And that's why this whole concept of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is not <laughs> only ridiculous, it's actually not possible because the nervous system is gonna go right back to what it knows best. And the same thing that happens when you're, um, if, you, if you are under stress, you go back to your default behavior. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, my horse has always been really, it was difficult and now he's okay with something and then some trauma happens and they go back to the thing that they learned first. Now, what we think about in T-Touch is that if we can start to change through touch, through movement, um, through different neural experiences, we can start to create new patterns or new experiences that are better because the nervous system actually wants to do what's best for your body it's just that it doesn't always have that opportunity to follow through and and so it's um and then when you add to that the whole thing of cellular function i mean i'm sure all of you have known horses that, that that they came out and they were they had the same habits that their parents had and there's this thing called cellular memory and yep. you'll Sometimes I've seen three week old foals with exactly the same posture and the same, actually some same holding patterns as their mother has had. So, so mm -hmm. we found that we can actually work sometimes on the pregnant mares and that can make a difference when the foals are born. Wow. Yeah. And I, and I've seen that. I, in fact, you know, people will come to me, do you think I should breed this mare? And I'm like, Huh. <laughs> well, she doesn't like people and <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that sense of you know, things do get passed along the line in that in that memory. Yeah. And so so taking that, you know, some of the people out there may have done, you know, some of the the as Sinead called them, very sort of um subtle movements. Subtle. Yes, yeah, in the body work space yes. of, of this work. And, you know, I think I've always had this curiosity because I'm like, I know it works with the nervous system. I know it calms things. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love to kind of hear from you what, what, like, what's actually, if there's a sense of what's actually kind of going on there in that, in that work. Sinead, do you have a little sense of that? Um, oh, gosh, it's, it's quite hard to describe. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'll give it a burl. Um, so for me, it's, <laughs> um, it's being very quiet within yourself. Um, and, I, and as Robin touched base, noticing what the horse is giving you feedback. So it's, um, am I going too fast? The horse will, will basically tell you with either a blink of an eye or a swish, swish of the tail. Do I need to go softer? 
Um, so it's really just looking for that constant feedback, um, clearing your mind, you know, and being as present as you can with that with that horse. Also, the um, you know, everybody says it's the less is more theory comes into it, and this is a hundred percent correct. Um, even an approximation of the touch, you still get the horse still gets the benefit. And by so, approximation, is that like away from the body, or is that like just a little bit on, or? Um, well, it depends. I think that's one of Robin's <laughs> saying. It depends. Um, if you know you're, you're showing someone, um, you know, if I've worked with the horse and I want to show someone what to do when when I leave, and for them instead of you know getting really hung up on you know a hand placement, right. yeah, so just even an approximation still yeah. works for the horse. So I don't want people to absolutely overthink. Am I doing it right? Did I get it right? Is this what Sinead does? Just if you know, if the horse gives them, you know, that feedback saying, "Yes, that's that's really nice. I like what you're doing. Perfect. We don't need anything more." You know, and just even it doesn't have to be, um, you know, I'm coming out today and I'm working on my horse for 30 minutes and my horse is going to stand still. If they just want five minutes, I'm working on their legs. That's it. We don't, you know, the Tellington method does not say you need to do down the neck cross the back, all four legs, head, tail, you know, it's just basically the horse will give, they are, they are basically um, the leaders in, in that session. They dictate what actually goes on. Mm, awesome. Awesome. And Robin, do you have anything to share as far as sort of the, the impact on the nervous system of, of what? Well, I think, there? Back, I think it comes back to this whole thing about if we really, so, so cells also have, there's like an electrical system in the cells. Yeah. And when you um, have this light touch where, so it's not threatening to the body. Um, Linda constantly keeps saying to people is, I want you to think about the perfection of the cells. So if mm. you have disease, if you have discomfort or whatever it is, and you think about the perfection of what it can be, instead of looking at always the sort of what it isn't. And she makes like one of our little sort of sayings is change your mind, change your horse. And it yep. makes such a difference. You, you, you know, we've all know these horses that have always had this sort of negative association and people are saying, oh, you're this and you're that and so on. And that they are such emotional sponges about things that it, it's no, they pick up on all sorts of things in terms of, you know, how we um, sort of react to them. And I, I think that, so I, I think that, and when you really feel it on yourself, and I was thinking about this, see, T-Touch is one of the very few modalities done on horses that didn't actually start with people. It's yeah, just, I was, I was going to say, like most modalities, yeah. you know, exactly. you have I massage say, and osteopathy, say, chiropractic, yeah. like it's all acu acupressure. Yeah. 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 It, all, it all started first with, with the Bowen therapy. All of the stuff yep. started with people. And so, and, and, all, and so what we've done is gone the other way. We started with horses and then we came full circle back to people. So we also do work on people. But one of the differences in also how we work on people, which goes in how we work on horses is we have a feedback scale. And this is the thing is we, we want to ask people for feedback about how it feels for them. So I don't go in with this idea. I know what's going to be good for you. It might hurt a little bit, but you know okay see horses don't buy that whole theory about no pain no gain and <laughs> so you know humans you just suck it up and and on they go you do pretty much anything and they just gotta go oh yeah that feels good you know when you stop oh and yeah well i hear about this <laughs> intramuscular stimulation i'm like that sounds like torture yeah. <laughs> like stick and a muscle into like your really tight or a needle into your really tight muscle and then like turn the electrical on it's like yeah. Yeah. oh god i don't think a horse would stand for that well, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't work, that those things don't work. But what we found so interesting in terms of gaining trust, and we want, we want people to have the trust of the, uh, of the practitioner that's working with them and also feeling to be able to give feedback and trust their own bodies and actually honor their own bodies. So that if something is not okay, like, so we might, we have this sort of scale from zero to sort of 10 and like a zero or one would be stop that is not very good. A 10 would be where well, you could never stop, which of course we wouldn't do. But, um, and we, so we'll say to people, well, is the, is the pressure, what, what if we did a little bit lighter pressure? Or what if we changed the part of the hand we were using? Or what if we 
gave a longer pause. And, and then, so people also take responsibility for things. Now, this is really important to trauma. And we had one of our, uh, we were in Hawaii at one of the t chats for you, and um, one of our instructors had had a bungee cord hit her just on the lower eye. She was really lucky she didn't, but it, it fractured the, the cheekbone. And, and it was healed, but she couldn't even touch it herself. She had so much fear around it. And that's what we're looking to do is release fear at a cellular level. Mm. And that's one of the things that when Linda did this pilot study with Professor Pop, and he's a German that has kind of done most of the research about cellular function. And, um, and, sh and he, so he met, has this measurable thing of how cells change and so on. And in the little bit that they did, he was really amazed at how much change what the touch did actually to the electrical system of the, of the cells and how he, I don't know how he measures it, but it was a measurable wow. um, somehow. But we're so, you know, we, we feel like with T-Touch, you will feel less while it's being done, but you'll feel it for longer, say, than you would if you had a, any other sort of typical kind of body, most other types of body work, other than cranial sacral work. And I would say that probably cranial sacral work is, as close to T-touch in terms of the philosophy of flying below the radar of the nervous system, you know, keeping I, the nervous system yeah. feeling safe because how we feel will be reflected in how we act. Mm -hmm. mm. Same with the horses. I would love, Sinead, I feel like you have something you want to say about that because I know you kind of do both, so... Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear you. You're like, I, I got to get in there. Yeah. Um, so share, you know, you, having kind of felt both of those, those modalities in your hand. What, well, your they really, really complement um, each other. I, like, I've done level one in equine bowing. Um, I've done a few, you know, just, you know, testing other modalities. But Tellington work and craniosacral work is... They're an absolute match made in heaven. They really work so well um, because there's such a light touch. It's just, yeah. And there's things happening beneath the surface um, that you know, you know is there. And you just trust and know and just let it happen. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And both, of course, working with the nervous system yes. in very um, important ways. So, yeah. yeah. Great, great. Um, and I, we've, we've done a, couple, a podcast or two on cranial sacral work. So yeah. <laughs> um, I appreciate that to, that sort of connection in as well. And, and um, I, I really want to talk, speak more. Um, I know, Robin, you were sharing about a, a book that, you're, that Linda and your daughter um, sort of collaborated on. Um, and I cannot remember the name, even though you just told yeah, it to yeah, me. No, no <laughs> oh, I'm actually going to just mention something. I, 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 the, another reason yes. that people focus about T-Touch so much on the body work is because of Heartland. <laughs> no way. <laughs> is it in there? Uh, it, start, it was in the original books of Heartland. In fact, when they started the series, when CBC started the series, they contacted me. And the premise of the books, because I, I don't remember who wrote, wrote the books, but there was a lot of T-Touch in the original books. And the, the mother, this whatever her, I don't even know, I haven't really watched the show, but um, was a, she was a veterinarian and she was a T-Touch practitioner. So they asked me for a certificate that could go in on the set in her office. Oh my gosh, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, and, and it was interesting because we used to do the, um, the main event quite often. And one year in Red Deer, uh, they had the cast from Heartland, and of course, they were. It was actually right near our booth, and you know, they clamor around the stars, the young girls, and they would come into the booth and they'd say, "Am I doing these circles correctly?" So, so <laughs> oh my was, goodness! The show's taken a little bit of a different turn, kind of away from the books, I think. But but it was that that is another reason. So it's constantly reinforced for people. I you know I completely understand it. But you know, Linda's written so many books, and the. The book, the, the book that she wrote, I don't even know when the under, um, getting in touch with your horse, understanding personality and um, by facial characteristics. And, and yes, was, yes. I was actually just like chatting about that one because I, I was, I was saying how much I love like side by side, double swirl horses. The world. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> they're like my favorite <laughs> horses. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they're, they're not for everybody, but you know, because a lot of people can't, they don't know how to deal with horses that, that show emotion. And, and so they can be your very best horses and your worst nightmare if you're not the type of person that is, you know, that understands it, you know, that's, so that book was actually Trafalgar's bestseller for years. It's out of print now, but it's a, it's a fabulous, a fabulous book. And so over the years, that, that then in, I think, 2000, and I was thinking how far back it was, the, Linda did the ultimate horse training and behavior work, which was a bit like um, an encyclopedia about T-Touch. There's like a, a section on, like, here's a case study with a problem for a horse. So go to pages, this, 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 these are things that you can do to work with it. And then there's, you know, there's chapters on, um, on each of the touches, like which touch you might use for trust and which for, you know, some sort of uh, different sorts of issues and what groundwork you would use. Um, so that's been a great book. And, and then, but the thing that we were really missing was something to tie it together to actually um, working with training horses. And of course, we've been um, starting horses for, well, well, Linda has been starting horses quietly for probably 60 years. Wow. And her first husband used to write a, a, a column for Hor uh, Western Horsemen and it was called Let's Ride. And it was, um, it was a, uh, they would just put little columns about what to do. And it was really interesting because they wrote a column about starting horses saying that, you know, you didn't, horses didn't have to buck when they were started. And they, if you took them through this process, they wouldn't buck. And this was in the sixties. And Western horsemen dropped their column because it didn't go with their philosophy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, I wish I was more surprised. I mean, I am, but I'm not. Um, I know. Oh my I know. goodness. So for years, and, 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 you know, Linda used to do a, a training, um, she used to do a weekend training class at Cal Poly and uh, for amateur owners. And it was um, how to teach people how to start their own horses. And it was basically, and I, think, I believe that if, if people just went even through the process, like this sort of step-by-step -step calm process we use, they may not feel comfortable to get back their horses for the first time, but the horses would be so much more prepared to, to go to work with someone else, you know, so that, that would be helpful. So this book is um, called Training and Retraining Horses the Tellington Way, and um, it goes through sort of the body work that we would use to just help help horses relax so they're in a better state being able to recognize when your horse is uncomfortable because you can't expect horses to um you know to function well under saddle if they're in pain and so and then i mean for years what we've done is we've just gone through a quiet stage of you know teaching them to lunge but not racing around in a circle and just mm -hmm. quietly teaching them you know, walk, trot, stop, moving with them, not standing in the middle, standing still, and then and then ground driving, but ground driving from a halter, not from a bit. They don't know a bit. It doesn't really make sense to me to stick a bit and then put all these long lines on a horse when they have no concept. So really um, step-by-step um, ways that we um, start horses. And for about 27 years, we went to Bitterroot Ranch every year and started, they had a breeding program with Arabs. And so we um, had a week long starting young horse training. And we, um, and they, they started their horses for that they were going to use on the dude ranches. Um, and the horses, some of their horses are still in their, in their program. So it was just step by step. Their horses were not handled, like they're not afraid of people. Mm -hmm. but they're not, hand they're not really handled. You know, people will go up and see, they don't know anything. They didn't know how to lead at the beginning of the week. They didn't know how to really do anything. And um, so we would work with them and get them whatever was appropriate for that horse. Some of the horses we were on and, and rode them at the end, but it's not a, it's not a timed event. And this concept of, you know, horse training being a timed event is one of the worst things that ever happened to horses. Oh my gosh. I, I can't even go to the main event. Uh, no, it's so sad. You know, it's, it's do, just, yeah. The, the trainer's challenge. I'm like, Oh God. Yeah, I know. So anyway, this is a way that people can, um, you know, people that, that can really, you know, work with their own horses, or maybe they just want to restart them because I think Sinead, that's, you've done that with several of your horses, haven't you? They were yes. they're young horses, but you restarted them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Robin. Um, and uh, 
I have I've got six horses uh, with all different backgrounds. Um, some thoroughbreds, the standard bred. Um, you know, there was one in the racing industry, but even though he's a Clyde Cross, so they've all come back with different. I don't like to use the word issues or problems, but they come back with inconsistencies. And then I had to start from the very beginning. And I basically seen them in, with different eyes and just gave it a complete blank slate. Like, oh, you know how to walk on a lead. Um, or, you know, you know how to stop. They, they didn't. They were never, you know, taught about it. You know, um, with the Tellington method, you, you know, you walk beside your horse with the lead beside your horse and not underneath its head. So uh, trying to put them into a balanced position as well. So um, it was, I gave them choices and they never had choices. So that was really nice. I'm not saying all of them never had choices. They did. But with me, they were given choices. And for once in their life, they were like, huh? So, what? <laughs> I'm able, I, I can do this or not do this. And that gave them a lot more confidence, which was really, really lovely to see. And when, with more confidence, then our relationship changes. Hmm, I love that. And, and I would love to chat more about that, Sinead, just because I, I'm sure there's listeners that are, you know, maybe starting a young horse or thinking about uh, about yeah. that or, or you know they have a horse that that is maybe a little bit older that that has some things going on um, oh, I, uh, you know I, and and so for you with with doing this with with a few of your horses yeah you know what like I I I, I hesitate to get into timelines and things like that but what what did that process look like look like you know I know oh. it probably looked different for different horses right. but <laughs> Yeah. Um, how did it look like? Well, every day I just seen as a, as a, a new slate, like a, a clean slate. And um, I never made a plan. <laughs> and I know as Robin always says, make a plan and plan to deviate. So whatever, you know, mm -hmm. if they wanted to go for a walk or if we want, we, you know, wanted to go through uh, the playground, because I've got a playground with elements set at home, um, if they wanted to do body work, um, it's based, if they didn't want to do anything, that was fine. I put them away. You know, I also had to check in with myself and see if I was rushed for time. Um, so I don't want ego to get in the way to go, right, today, this is what we're going to do. So, um, and every horse is unique as well and what they can actually take on board. So uh, some days you'd fast forward a lot quicker. Um, and then some days we, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do anything, we'd just hang out. So I, there's no linear process with the Tellington method as well. So, and that's what I absolutely love about it. It's, um, I don't want to say in eight weeks time, I want to see my horse doing X, Y, and Z. Hmm. It's, yes, it's, it's all about them and for that moment in time. Yes. Well, and I think we, we, you know, as humans, we live in this, we exist in this space where we're like, I must have a plan. I need to like, <laughs> this is how it's going to go. This is the timeline. Like, we need yes. to be doing this by this time, you know, um, it can be quite difficult, you know, to, to set, set that agenda aside. It's um, so hard for us not to get caught up in, we must do, we have to do, um, because, you know, um, and it's so hard not to look around at our, you know, fellow riders and our friends and, and to see them off, you know, doing competitions or, or not competitions or just going on a trail ride and you haven't gotten on your horse or it's, you know, you don't want to ride or the horse doesn't. So we really have to, you know, take it all back, um, and just step out of our ego. It is, it's really, really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I appreciate like, I appreciate that, you know, reflection for a lot of people. I was like literally just on the phone with a, a new client yesterday and she was sort of in, in the emotion of yeah. like, oh my gosh, I need to like, I must step back. I must yes. allow yes. my horse to it just this exact process to begin again, to begin exactly. again and build foundation again. Oh, exactly. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's really encouraging to know that that, you know, that is so possible. That is so possible. Oh, absolutely. And I do know that you will build a better relationship because you, you know, um, 
you're listening to your horse as well. And yeah. the, that relationship, just that foundation is just magical, you know, instead of just making them do things, they've just got a choice. I just think it's absolutely magical. Mm, thank you. And Robin, I'd love, love to have you tune in here again, because I, you know, we want to talk more about this this book and I, I want to read this book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, there's a couple of things too that, I mean, there are some times where you just have to get things done too. Yeah. And that's one mm. of the things that um, there's possibility of getting things done, but getting them done in a way that doesn't compromise your, how you want to be with your horses. Um, and, and it's, I mean, one of them is, I, I remember, a, you know, was it a course, teaching a course and a horse, they had tied a horse in a wash rack and they tied him up to the wall and they gave him a shot in the rear end on the opposite side of like a, you know how wash racks have the pipe sort of piping some of them in between them, like a, a, a low pipe fence. And this horse had bucked up, got his hind end over the, this piping in the wash rack. So he was like stuck there. Oh my God. And of course, and he's tied up. And of course they, you know, like, cause it, there'd been people at the stable going, well, it's nice, you know, that you can be nice to your horse until you have to do something. So they, it, so anyway, I helped them get the horse off. We untied him, got him off. And of course he's completely bruised the whole, like all up the, yeah. up, uh, the front of the hind legs. And so the next day they come to me and they go, well, you know, you say that you can get things done in a nice way, but we're trying to hose this horse and he just keeps flying forward over top of us. So I said, well, I'll show you, I'll see what I can do. I don't make any promises because for sure one thing that I do not have is attachment to outcome. So for me, it's a huge part of where, where do I kind of have to step? I, 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 I'm going to get where I want to go, but I might have to take some different routes. And um, so, so we have this technique that we call taming the tiger. And it did start with actually a, a, a one of someone in the cat family, but, um, and it's like a sliding cross tie. So the horse is, um, there's, it's the, the, you've got a line on them and then the line goes around something and back to your hand. So you can slide with it. So I, so we were in the wash rack because what they were trying to do is hold this horse back. Now, physically hold this horse back while they sprayed water on his unpleasantly, really sore hind legs. That's not going to happen. So, um, he would be put up with it for about two seconds and then jump forward over top of them. So I put him in this taming the tiger. I gave him space. I just took the one and stroked his chest and his hind and his front legs and his belly and his hind legs. And then I took the, and I did this by myself. And then I took the hose and I just started it next to him. I mean, it's common sense, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just, I let it, like, if he's nervous about it, I moved away for a moment. And then I, and it took me five minutes maybe. And then I, he was just standing there and, you know, accepting the water on his hind legs and he's standing relaxed. And, but you know, we're in such a hurry and sometimes we have to go a little bit slower to go faster. Mm. And, and, and I think that's that, you know, that for me, those kinds of things, because of course people are always, well, you're just so nice to horses and you know, I am nice to horses and horses don't walk over me and horses don't, I can still, get done what I want and not be, and not be compromised anyway, but also, you know, in my opinion, kind of be fair, be fair to the horse and give them a moment. Like one of the most important things that we do is pause. Yes. And, and, you know, if, if you're having a problem with something is just stand back for a moment and take a breath and exhale and go, huh, you know, what part of this, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So, you know, where can I go with this to go, huh? Hmm. I wonder if I just gave the horse a moment and I just took a moment and I promise you nine times out of 10, you can then go forward from that. Yeah. I, I love that. Cause I, I, I seem to have a, a brain that goes, this is never going to happen. Like it just, I kind of like lock into this. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> How is it possibly going to happen, you know? And, and I love watching people that are just like, it's cool. Like, just, just chill, you know? Um, it, it, it will, it will, it will go on. And so um, for those people that are a little type A like me, um, any advice? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, the more <laughs> tools you have, the more choice you have, the more patient you can be. I am the most uh, impatient person on the planet. The most except when it comes to T-Touch because I have so many choices. And what I know is 
that if, and this is how some of the, you know, sort of the best ideas I think that I've had have come from a sort of a situation where I actually didn't know what to do, but I just stood back and then went, well, let's see, I, I have so many possibilities of, of choice of different things to do that what gives me the patience is I know that if I just kind of go through them, something's going to happen. Loading will probably work. It's a huge one of that. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, I, I often say like, you know, it's important to have a toolkit with horses. It's important to expand that toolkit with horses. You know, the more that more awareness we have, the more that we know, the the more that we can, you know, maybe meet a need that, you know, we might not have been able to in the past. So Absolutely. that's a, a really yeah. great way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I'd love to, well, we have, we have like five or so minutes left, which is crazy. So <laughs> this always happens. I get to the end and I'm like, no, like I want to keep chatting forever. Um, so, uh, the nice thing is we can always do more. Um, yes. but I, I would love to chat, um, just a little bit more, um, about, Let's see some of some of the ways that you know. I know we've talked about the body work, and we've talked about some of the other some of the other pieces around the training. Um, but for people to kind of connect the dots of like how how is this? How does someone train their horse through T touch, especially from not knowing anything to to a point where I'm getting on, I'm riding, I'm doing doing some other things. I know that's probably a bit of a long answer, but big question <laughs> big question well, we actually for for our starting young horse um like when we do starting young horse trainings and so on we have we have a little um it's like a, it's it's sort of like a um a chart of all the things that we could do and then we what you do is we keep track and when, when i do the starting young horses um clinic here we we used to have 200 icelandics oh and my gosh I, I, one year we had 28 foals so I have a lot of experience with young horses and we would breed anywhere from, um, yeah, two to 28, usually five or six foals a year. And we don't start um, training our foal. We don't start riding until they're four. We don't start the training process actually until they're four. And, um, and even, so we start them when they're foals by quietly handling them because the problem is when they're little, people can do with them what they want because when they're small, you can do it because you can. And if you can start out in a way that the horses learn to have self-control, because when, when you teach them to have, um, if you teach them, if you improve the self-carriage or the posture, it helps to improve the self-confidence, which helps to improve self-control. So we work with all of that with young horses. And then we have this like little checklist that we go through. So, you know, simple things like, you know, how is your horse how is your horse about having contact all over? Quiet contact with your hands. How is your horse about being groomed? If your horse is uncomfortable about being groomed or touched on the back or the belly, how likely are they to be comfortable with a saddle? If you can't touch them, if they're nervous about things coming up from behind, how safe are they going to be to ride? So we kind of look at all of these uh, you know, there's, if you're really experienced, you can deal with lots of these problems. I've had ho people with horses here and I'm going, how do you ride this horse? And they'll say, very carefully. <laughs> you know, that's fine for a trainer, but because we, we used to sell up to 100 horses a year and we would produce horses or who, to, for people who were usually uh, novice uh, riders or people who were getting back into horses after a long, you know, uh, break and they were maybe a little nervous. So we wanted to have horses that were safe, that were, you know, confident um, and, were, and that's, so that's why we would take them through this whole process. And, you know, in terms of how long it takes, that so depends on your experience and the horse. Because mm. we've had horses that in a few days were really comfortable doing all sorts of things. And we've had other horses that took longer. So, you, you know, you can't, but it isn't, you know, it's not a timed event. So you want to make sure your horse is really comfortable. Can your horse lead and be in balance? So we have all these kind of, and I'm going to say weird because they're unusual to the rest of the horse world, ways of interacting with horses on the ground so that, as Sinead was saying, that they, it improves their balance because you can't expect a horse that's out of balance on the ground to be able to then carry a rider. 
No, so, no. So we teach them about how to spatial awareness, but it's not about respect. It's not about anything, but showing them where we want them to be. How can we get them to, to walk in a straight line? So we actually lunge in straight lines and then in ovals rather than in circles, because circles are one of the most difficult things for a horse to negotiate physically. Yep. And um, so we have this distance. So we have this step-by-step. -step. We have, we go, um, we have a process where we go under things, we go between things, we go over things, but it's done in a way so the horse can be successful. So if, if something's difficult, what do we do? We make it easier. And, and if, if they can't go under things, that's going to be a huge thing. Do I want to get on a horse that can't go, say, under two pool noodles that you could have at an angle? Or we make, um, you know, we use a, like, we make shower curtains that are cut so it's like a car wash. But we make it easy. Like, don't ask them to go through the whole thing. So chunk it down into small pieces so that we're looking for success. Because can you imagine if everything you did in your life that people did it to you until you couldn't do it. You'd give up. Oh, totally. And, and that's what we sort of do with horses. Like you hear people talking all the time about overcoming resistance. So what if we were to set it up in a way so that we can see what's difficult? And it's not that we do nothing, because we do. Like even on any given day, we can say, no, we're going to stop. But we could also say, well, this is hard for you. There's no, let's do something else, or let's put you away, or you know what? I, because if usually yeah. there's also something that's going on in us if we're not in a space to be able to um, to do something. Yeah, absolutely. There's that was all the human emotion to it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Robin, I pre I have this question because with so many horses, how long for each horse typically for you? Um, in a typical so training. I would session. say that in our so how long like when we were when we do our starting in horse trainings we and we're not doing them quite this way anymore but so we would bring a horse out where we bring three horses out at a time because that's the other thing when you can yep. work multiple horses together it's so beneficial actually instead of this you know isolation thing that people do with horses yep. and um so we might work with them for uh 20 minutes 30 minutes an hour but it wouldn't be on the same thing you see we yep. wouldn't doing the same thing and okay. so what we do is so here's the thing also about the nervous system you talk i think you talked to uh violet van s has yep. the biology of freeze yep so in order for learning to keep taking place you have to have curiosity so if you have this horse that starts to shut down for you like they just are shutting down they're not learning they can't learn because the nervous system, it's a coping mechanism of the nervous system. So there is stress in any sort of learning. There's stress in anything that you're gonna make a change of, but the, the trick is, or the, the, you have to find that place where it's um, enough that it's okay, because when they hit the wall, there's a release of a hormone called ACTH and it blocks learning. Yep. And this is what you see at the, at the main event and some of these things where the horses are pushed and pushed and then they just, they just kind of shut down or they, or they you know, give up. And there's no learning that's taken place in that, at that time. And um, our nervous systems have eh, three to four brain slots, if we're lucky, open at any given time to take on new information. Mm -hmm. So animals have to be the same. So no. just because you've done something doesn't mean you know how to do it. And so what we would do is like, so we might do a lesson depending on what the lesson was. Um, when we bring the horse back the next time, what I look at if I'm going through, you know, some sort of steps with my horses, do I have, to, can I start where I finished? Mm. Or do I have to go back? It's fine to go back. But, but are they retaining? Exactly. Yep. Are they retaining? Yep. Okay. Wow. All right. Well, I I hate to bring this conversation <laughs> to an end. I'm so like, I'm like, oh gosh. Um, I'm sure our listeners are feeling the same. Um, so we will, we will have to do it again sometime. I would really love, love that. Yeah. Okay. And I appreciate you two both coming on tonight. It's been really wonderful to have you both here sharing. Um, about this Thanks this work that. and yeah thank you yes. mm -hmm. yeah, it's very fun very fun for me i i i, I love talking about the work
Oh, I, it shows. It shows. I, I love. I love hearing about it. I've learned so much in in our time together tonight as well. And um, for for those out there that are are wanting to connect, um, Sinead, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Okay, uh, they can contact me via Facebook. So.